Hey everybody, we're going to do the cannabis and cognition section. I'm hoping you can see this. Ideally, what I would do is talk about the acute effects of cannabis first, and then we get into the chronic effects, meaning the effects that are present in people who've used a long time but who aren't necessarily uh, under the influence of cannabis right then at that time. But I want to make sure we understand there are some important methodological things to consider when we talk about these effects. And I know some of you have PTSD from research methods, so let's just take a look here. By acute effects, I literally mean you've just had exposure to cannabis, or in some of these examples, it's just THC by itself, as opposed to chronic Obviously, the methodological tricks here are that you've got to have somebody who's used it, say, every day for two years, but who isn't currently under the influence of cannabis, hasn't used recently. That alone can be kind of cumbersome. So we've got uh, a few ha handful of studies where folks have uh, essentially used cannabis every day for quite a long time, but then they go to the hospital and stay there and don't use overnight and then come. Now we've got a potential issue with withdrawal if you believe in such a thing, or is it actually a chronic effect? So some of this gets a little intricate. Are there some take-home messages, though? Are there some things that will essentially uh, reliably show up in data and things that are worth talking about from this literature? Yeah, people think and remember differently during cannabis intoxication, all right? Chronic consumption might change aspects of cognition as well, but they're extremely small effects, often difficult to detect without a brain scanner or an EEG machine. And then the deficits associated with intoxication are relatively specific, right? So we're gonna find some deficits, but we're not gonna be able to make much of them necessarily if we talk about what are their practical implications Let's get into this. So while we're thinking about it, I just want to be mindful of some key methodological issues. First and foremost, what's the size of the sample? Right? If the sample is really huge, an effect can reach statistical significance, but it might be a little bitty dinky effect, right? It might really not matter much, right? So some of the chronic effect on memory. They give folks uh, a list of words to learn, and uh, the non-users get a list of words to learn, and they say, oh, look, it's statistically different, but the effect is really small. Because they have such a huge sample, that gets interpreted as statistically significant. Right? So let's ask, how big is this sample? How big is the effect? The effect literally is, so how far apart are the means in these groups? relative to how much spread is there within groups, right? Not all cannabis users are alike. Not all folks who don't use cannabis are alike, right? So let's make sure we appreciate how much variation there is within groups before we start drawing conclusions about differences between groups. And then I really want to be mindful of ceiling and floor effects. So I've seen a whole lot of stuff where uh, somebody will call me up and say, look, Dr. Mitch, there's no difference between cannabis users and non-users on the mini mental state exam. And I'll say the mini mental state exam is for people with Alzheimer's. Like, it's so easy. Everybody probably got them all right. So, of course, you can't detect anything. Why not make sure your test is sensitive enough? And then some floor effects, too. Oh, look, the cannabis users just got everything wrong on the balancing ionic equations test. Well, you know, nobody got anything right. Who remembers that stuff unless they're a chemistry major? All right. So again, I just want to illustrate, we may have two distributions that differ on some measure of central tendency, but odds are high there's a ton of overlap to try to draw conclusions about every single cannabis user or every single non-user from these data is a gross, gross error. Let's keep this in mind, particularly when you're reading new stuff in the news. All right. Bottom line, some replicable effects. Yes, when people are high, they have problems concentrating, attending to details, focusing on goals, performing two actions at the same time simultaneously, at least if they have to be done rapidly. Learning new complex information is harder, right? Trying to absorb some new information, not a good idea. And then none of these are surprising, but they grow worse with higher doses. 
and with more complicated tasks. Right? What's a classic complex reaction time? Plain reaction time, hey, you hear the bell hit the space bar? Lots and lots of high-dose cannabis studies show really not much of an impact on that. But if you got to hit the space bar when you hear the bell, hit the Q when you see the blue light, hit the R when you see the red light, as it starts getting more complicated, we start seeing more pre and post differences in within subject studies or groups who got placebo tend to do better than groups who got cannabis when the tasks get more complicated. Let's get into some of the details on this, but these are all acute effects. Generally, we've got some tasks that are clearly not affected, some that looks like probably, but we're not sure, um, possibly, I guess we could call them, and then the probably affected. These are effect sizes that are uh, big enough that I would expect them to show up if we did another study with a comparable sample size. All right, so uh, as you can see, Stacy makes slides that are much more detailed than I would, but this can be super informative for you. So yeah, a simple learning paired associations test is essentially unaffected. Folks who get placebo don't do any better than folks who get cannabis and the remote member, memory stuff. So if you've got retrieved material that you've already learned, odds are high cannabis isn't going to have much of an impact. So if they uh, had to word learn word lists before they came to the lab or before they got intoxicated, also some of the word fluency tests. So if I say, hey, write down every word you can think of that starts with the letter R, cannabis doesn't seem to uh, lead to any deficits in that, although people do crack up laughing while they're doing it. Um, I need you to tell me, do you remember this TV show? Odds are high. There may be an intoxicated practice issue with that, but people seem to uh, have data supporting that. Now, in all studies, participants knew the material before they used cannabis. Remote memory is not impaired. Charlie Tart did that big uh, study, just a big self-report questionnaire survey back in 1970 got it published in 1971 when nobody really knew anything about cannabis in the United States. And he showed some people were more likely to spontaneously remember things from the past. Um, often stuff that they said, I haven't thought about that for, for years. I forgot about my teddy bear. Or, oh man, that sound that I always wondered about, that's the sound of my mom crying. Right? These big kind of insightful incidents, uh, people claim cannabis does uh, actually increase those. And then some possible unaffected tasks also include simple reaction time, right? So just one stimulus, one response. If it's not a complex decision, people seem to do okay. The simple reaction time, basically small, statistically significant, but not particularly meaningful. Now, this may be dose dependent, right? Maybe if we really cranked it up, everybody gets, you know, 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, then suddenly, wow, this is going to be a big deal. All right, the possibly unaffected tasks. So disinhibition is basically I'm trying to not do something that is my usual response. I've got to, I've got to keep that back. I've got to hold it back. So a great test of this that's used a lot is the Stroop effect. And as you guys know, Essentially what happens is I'm going to have a task where I'm going to show you some words and your assignment is tell me what color these words are printed in. And then, of course, the words are the name of a color that doesn't match. And the tendency is, of course, to read rather than to say the color because that's the more practiced response. Let's see if she set this up. All right, yeah, there you see. And if you yelled blue, yeah, that was right. But you'll notice you'll, your first response is to yell red. And in fact, the correct answer is blue. So you've got to inhibit the reading and go to the color naming. Do the best you can with this one. Red. Right. My first thought is green. And there we go. All right. And obviously they do a whole bunch at once on the computer and, you know, it goes much faster and they record you and things like that. But it looks like small but replicable, replicable effects. I mentioned I used to do this with hyperactive kids at, uh, 
at the grade school in Chinatown and uh, one kid did a really great job with it. And I said, man, you really killed that. And he said, yeah, I don't know how to read. But <laughs> the bottom line is this uh, has a modest uh, measure of disinhibition and it looks like cannabis has um, a modest impact on it. So Stacy emphasized that um, some of the studies had no effect, but they often had small sample sizes. Maybe there are other domains of uh, cannabis consumption disinhibition that we could use. So there's some other tests that we might want to try on this. And in a sense, these are supposed to be analogs to more important things like inhibiting your response to, you know, go uh, have sex without a condom or sleep with somebody you shouldn't sleep with or uh, drink another beer, right? And those are the measures that I think would be much more meaningful. Let's, let's not make too much of this literature. And then the vigilance, the sustained atten attention tasks, um, the classic one is called continuous performance task, and it's literally a number shows up at the center of the screen, and anytime it's an eight, you're supposed to hit the space bar as fast as you can. And it doesn't look like cannabis has a big impact on this. It goes on and on. So uh, this, this experiment, they used it for seven minutes, which isn't that grueling. I think that after a half an hour, it's... Uh, most, most cannabis users would just say, never mind, I don't want to do this, right? But uh, if there's a financial reward involved, usually folks are willing to persist. And if there's something meaningful about it, right? If I said, hey, do a great job on this and uh, I won't kill your parents or something like that, right? Then suddenly it's, it's more motivating. Not that cannabis creates a motivational syndrome, and you saw my video on that. It's just that uh, people tend to see through the game of just participating in an experiment without any reinforcers. All right. The other one was uh, a little bit like that Macintosh clock, cl clock that we talked about with the nicotine thing, but basically you're going to see a neon light in a series. All these neon bulbs make a circle, and it looks like it's moving, basically. And so it goes beep, 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 beep. And every once in a while, it'll skip. It'll just do two in a row, and that's when you're supposed to hit the space bar. It's dreadfully dull, right? Cannabis doesn't have a huge impact on this, but ugh, what, what a horrible test, right? So I think something more important would be, can you be vigilant on putting together widgets, you know, washing dishes, things like that? And uh, the anecdotal work is, yeah, you can so what do we really need to know? Do people develop tolerance to this? And I'm guessing that they would. And would financial incentives increase performance? I really do think they would. As you can imagine, the National Institute on Drug Abuse doesn't want to fund this kind of work. They don't want to have us discover that cannabis could be sidestepped with a little practice. All right. Probably affected. So soon after using cannabis, so when THC is definitely at a detectable blood level, um, they just say, okay, uh, time estimation task. And we've talked about these before, but basically it's um, going to say, hit the space bar, wait 30 seconds, and then hit the space bar when you think 30 seconds have passed. And they do it at about 20 seconds, right? It really feels like time is going slower. Um, a correlate with that is this notion that it seems like space is also deviant, like it looks like You've traveled a long time. It feels like you went far away, but truth be told, it's kind of confounded with how long you felt like you were driving. So time estimation is clearly impaired. Time is slowed. And then some issues with perception. We alluded to this before. So problems distinguishing depth, although we do have that case study, that guy who claimed it was the first time he ever got to see in 3D. He was in the mountains and got high. And then the perception of color. It looks like on the blue end of the spectrum, People claim they really appreciate it a lot. That light's messing up. But um, people claim they really appreciate the colors more, but they have trouble distinguishing between uh, different shades of blue. All right. And then the reading aloud, there's really only one big study on this, and they literally did the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, and you had to read it while... Uh, you were hearing your own voice in your ears 
a quarter a second delayed. And I mean, it's such a complicated, aversive task anyway. And yeah, when you had to read it backwards after using Canvas, people did not do as well. What does this generalize to in your real life? I hope nothing, right? Anytime your phone does that quarter second delay thing, it drives me completely bananas. So yeah, marijuana intoxication, impaired reading aloud under these circumstances. If there was a longer passage, they made more mistake. Yeah, practical implications are less than clear. Right? Now, probably affected the classic math problem we've talked about before. Count backward from 100 by 7. Any of those serial 7s things. So you'd go, oh, 93, 86, 79, 72. That's hard enough when you're not high. And it gets worse after using pretty much anything psychoactive. So yeah, cannabis intoxication decreases mental ability. Attention associated with computation. People might develop tolerance to these as well. Obviously, I've done serial sevens from 100, 100 times. It's not a big deal to me. But if you make me start at 113, then I'm like, ah. All right. Also probably affected the complex reaction. So if you got a different button in response to different events, uh, of course, cannabis intoxication does seem to make an impairment of that. They press the wrong button more often. Their reaction times tend to get longer, and we're talking about like 50% increase sometimes, right? which, again, it's just uh, in milliseconds, but that could be meaningful under some circumstances. People do appear to develop tolerance with repeat, repeated practice while intoxicated, all right? And truth be told, almost any task can benefit from intoxicated practice, and I'm not saying go do these while you're high. I'm just saying that People are still capable of learning in the presence of all the cues of the drug. All right. Uh, other aspects of memory. So we do see issues with both recognition and recall for new material. Right. So if you haven't already encoded it, that may be an issue. In the uh, setting where basically you're asked, go ahead and learn this list of 15 words. Right. And then... After a while, I say, okay, now write down all the ones you remember, all right? In free recall, they just don't seem to come up with as many words, or they list words that weren't on there. And in the recognition test, I say, here's 30 words, which were the 15 that were on there. They're like, oh, they all look familiar to me. So uh, everything's connected during cannabis intoxication. All right, and then... Uh, Stacy did a good job of summarizing these on the slides. So yeah, results for words do not generalize to all practical aspects of memory. In particular, what is cannabis's impact on meaningful events? I really would like to see the literature on, say, eyewitness testimony, which is terrible all the time anyway. How about the meaning of conversations, which some folks may remember the meaning but may not remember it word for word. And then which of the following is a way that disinhibition has been studied in individuals who use cannabis? So this is cute that Stacy came up with this little multiple choice question. Obviously the Stroop task is, is the one. That's how we measure disinhibition. All right. Now if you're cool with that, I don't want to uh, overload the recording on PowerPoint here. So let me stop this I'll stop the Zoom version. We'll figure something out. I'll be right back. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, I know this stuff isn't as riveting as, say, the subjective effects of cannabis, but I appreciate you learning it.